Greetings everyone, I'm Mr. Mocha Lover, and thank you for joining me here to the start of a new campaign in TNO, the last days of Europe, in which we are playing as the West Russian Revolutionary Front. If you'd like to read about the country, go right ahead. Here's the next paragraph. Follow up with the next paragraph. Just basically showing us, or telling us, about how we got here in 1962 with the, Soviet, the remnants of parts of the Soviet Union trying to hold on, desperately trying to hold on. Well, wow, that's a lot of text. And how we have basically ended up near Arkhangelsk with uh, with the remnants of the Soviet Union, basically. So, And the features. Cool. Let us begin with the focus, shall we? Enduring. The West Russian Revolutionary Front nowadays could seem as yet another irrelevant and unknown warlord state in Russia, perhaps owning slightly more territory than one would expect. However, anyone with a good knowledge of recent history knows that for the glory days of the Front, when it stretched from Arkhangelsk to Orsk, and was the torchbearer of the Russian liberty and socialism. Any dreams of liberation were crushed, though, with the West Russian Front, or West Russian War, and the destruction it brought onto us. We've been isolated in a corner of the former so Union, stuck in the further north, and based in Arkhangelsk. Despite the defeat in the 50s, the WRRF lives on. Now, we must seek to assess our situation and find every detail on resources and capabilities and how we can make the most out of it. Very cool. I'll let you know, this is my first attempt at playing these guys. I've not tried this off screen. I'm going in completely blind, but with high aspirations and maybe with a lot of love. We'll see what happens. I don't know. So I'll go low, go high. As you can see, I've already set up some of my generals. Let's see, so this division is 12 combat with, not bad, it's got some engineers, these guys have artillery too, but, I'd, 6 versus 6, well it's going to cost 10 anyways to throw it in there, what is their production currently like, what is their stockpiles currently, oh, hmm, not good, well, let's see, you both have engineers, you actually have 110 soft attack, you have 77, I'm going to go with the higher soft attack, there you go. Make two at a time if you can. That'd be good. These light infantry. It's actually not that bad. So it's only half light infantry and half infantry. So that's not too bad. And our motor, we have one motorized division, which is 10. Yeah, that's not too bad. That's not too bad. Cool. We can only get no political power every day, and we have no manpower. Well, then. <laughs> okay, then. Now, we do have a couple puppets. We have. What is it? Plesetsk with Tuchikevsky, and then Zukov is down there. Five dumb. You got the terror bombings. You got his little five dumb. Cool. Regardless, the failures of Barbarossa. The old days of General Secretary Bukharin's regime saw the nation of the Russian people under a greater, more equal state broken under the powers of the German war machine to the West. As the powers of Adolf Hitler and the circus of fascist pigs continue to slaughter our people and burn our lands during the curse, Operation Barbarossa, the General Secretary allowed the Union to become unequipped, undefended, and unprepared when the Nazis took hold of the German nation and all of our great motherland came to suffer the consequences and the butcheries that followed. A Soviet Union has been born after a world war most terrible. We are what remains of a united Soviet Russia, ready to face the barrel of the Nazi rifle under the greater Marshal Clement Voroshilov, the modern Bogadir. <clears throat> of, the, of all the tales of the Russian anarchy, there stands but one that is spread from the frozen lands of the far east to the cities of Kostrama in the west, and even, oh, my apologies, deep into the lands of the Nazi Empire, the story of a wanderer from parts unknown who brings justice with them as they walk the desolate roads of old Russia. The wanderer has become, to, or become one of the greatest enigmas in all of Russia. Little is known about this enigma. Some report they are a former ranger of the Ural Guard, man who left his home to bring justice to the worst of Russia. Others tell tales of this former Wehrmacht soldier consumed by guilt and under a self-imposed exile as a penance to the people he wronged. A few scant reports tell of a widow from a destroyed village, <clears throat> seeking to bring to others the justice she was denied. Whispers in the East speak of an American volunteer from the West Russian War, stuck in a land not his own but still doing good where he wandered. And in the bars of Siberian cities, one can always find strange and likely drug-induced tales of a man from the future where he comes back to save the world. Whatever the true identity and whatever the purpose and the corpse of the Soviet Union might be, all that is truly known is the kindness that is shown to the people so used to violence and death. Tales are told of the wanderer holding off entire bandit raiding parties single-headedly. Liberated slaves from Perm tell of an angel of light, freeing them from their shackles before disappearing into the night, and rumors of coming from Moscow of one man raid parties on Nazi strongholds. In the end, while many of these deeds are undoubtedly fictitious, the actions of this hero, the modern day bogatir, have lit a fire of hope in the hearts of even the most trampled upon in Russia. An interesting story, if nothing else. We have uh, quite a bit of authoritarian socialism. Well, there is some libertarian socialism. Can we go down the libertarian socialist path? I don't know. The Revolution's Northern Star. 
To the Black Forties, we carried on. The Germans, in their arrogance, thought the Soviet Union broken, consigned to the dustbin of history. Throughout the decade, we plotted and were prepared. Throughout Russia and Central Asia, men and women alike united for a great attempt to push back the fascists and the West Russian War. The complacent Germans suffered defeat after defeat as the armies of workers marched west. But at the height of our success, the Red Army was betrayed by our own people. Reactionary Russian dogs and Tsarist bootlickers helped the Russians turn back the tide and destroy our overstretched front lines. D deep beneath our lines as well. Revolt after revolt sprang up as demagogues preached the end of the Soviet Union. Now, the nation forged in Lenin's revolutionary flame has been reduced to a few scraps of the frozen land. Veterans of 20 years of endless warfare barely hold a position south of the Arctic Circle. Beyond our borders, dozens of warlords root or loot the ruins of Russia as the common people suffer in the Russian anarchy. We've lost contact with every other remnant of the Russian Red Army, pushed back from the stations in Central Asia and Siberia. Within our borders, starving refugees barely have enough calories to maintain our rusting industrial sector. Military officers squabble with one another, reflecting this disunity that proved fatal to the Soviet Union in the West Russian War. Through all this, the revolution endures. As the northern star shines above us, we so must work or provide eternal guidance to the workers of Russia and beyond. The workers' liberation is inevitable, a force of history that cannot be arrested by tyrants and madmen. If we do not succeed, then future generations shall remember our example. We will not stop fighting until either death or the day that blood-red banner of socialism flies anew. Comrades, onwards, the guiding star in the northern sky. Oh, we can scavenge for loot. I love scavenging for loot. I forgot about that early on. Uh, let's see. Is that house? Eh, we might use them. Maybe, maybe not. And we're going to immediately go ahead. We could grab that. I'd love more factories. And we actually have nine factories, which is pretty good. Mm, I'm still not used to raiding. I'm, I'm just coming off right from my Welsh campaign, so raiding is weird to me right now. Uh, let's see. Secure control. <clears throat> Vorkuta? Oh, how many divisions does Vorkuta have? You're telling me they have no manpower. Three to five divisions. We could be pretty good against them. And the, oh, Nega. Red Menace. They have way more divisions, so we'll throw all of you guys over here, actually. That'd be good. That'd be very good. You know, even though we have no manpower as well. <clears throat> How much manpower? Point five. That's not too bad, actually, for that much manpower every day. But next up, we'll get some industrial investments. I want more industry. Even though we could use more manpower. Oh, we're actually demobilizing. What's that? War support. Oh, we have a lot of poverty. Hitler named Speer's successor. So be it. Go ahead. If we can. Oh, they're looking even worse than us. At least our guys are looking mostly filled. These guys are looking super bad. I love beating up on weaker people. Ah. There was a Bob Rosian. Bob Rosa. The Bears of Suvorov. The Chronicles of History has taken account of the suffering of all of Russia's people. It sank the blood of those who died to overthrow the Tsardom, those who fought and killed and died to repulse the Nazi horde. However, Barbarossa is not the end of her bloodshed. No, for in the land of Surovov was where our men fought bravely once more to reclaim our rightful lands. Marshal of Shilov. Nearly we're taking our old capitals. However, all good things must come to an end as we fell once more on the brink of success during the 50s as Adolf Hitler sent his hordes against our winter line. Success was in a grasp, and yet we still fell. We broke, we retreated, we failed Russia, yet the West Russian Revolutionary Front has swallowed its failure and we shall march on wiser and more experience. A mysterious encounter. Vasily sat in his guard post, rifle cradled under his shoulder. He gazed into the wilderness that separated the front from those lands under the control of the Borkuta Gulag. He had been on the border for the last week, one of the few small regiments that guarded the flanks of the front. It would only be a few hours before he would be relieved by his replacement. Looking back out over the Arctic lands, he could barely make out something in the dist in the distance. A gray speck moving over the tundra. Lifting his binoculars, he focused on his target. It was a person, dressed in what looked like an old uniform of some kind. They were well dressed for the weather, a heavy jacket, gloves, and other winter gear. The their face was covered by a balaclava, and a type of helmet he could not recognize. Slung across the man's chest was a rifle, one well taken care of, most likely a model fresh from Zlatovs. Vasily watched the man as he got nearer, gripping his rifle tight. Finally, the man was within speaking distance. His hands held out to the side, away from his weapon. Halt! What are you doing here? This was a mysterious man so, sp then spoken broken Russian, halting or broken halting Russian. I come to warn. Bandits come from east. Many bandits plan attack tonight. Vasily could hardly understand the man. His accent was atrocious, but he understood enough. What? Gosh darn! All right, come up here. Don't do anything stupid. The man walked up the steps and walking into the guardhouse with his hands up. Stay alert, men. Many bandits, the stranger said. Vasily was quick to get on the horn to the garrison, but they would be unable to send help until the next day. Vasily and the stranger readied the guardhouse as well as they could and could do no more than wait. When the garrison sent reinforcements the next day, what they found shocked them. Vasily sat smoking on a stump outside. Bodies were piled high in the field surrounding and around the building. The stranger was nowhere to be found. Exceptional work, comrade Vasily. Hmm, <laughs> good job, Vasily, good job. And let's go and do this first. Just go ahead and do the raid. Our guys are already here, ready to go. And actually, we have our ally here, too. Ah, uh, I love having allies. 
across the lines. Dimitri, it's been some time since we talked, and I thought it would just be worthwhile to catch up. It gave me so much joy to discover you were still alive and well. Even with all the chaos happening beyond the Urals, I'm not certain what is happening over there, but my admittedly scattered sources do not paint an optimistic pu picture. I sincerely, sincerely hope you are safe. Whatever the case, I thought to enlighten you as to what I've been up to for the past few years. No doubt you've already heard about Operation Suvarov and the massive gosh darn disaster that was. It was not for the lack of trying. We had had those fascist pigs on the ropes, and if I had my way, I'd be writing this letter from Moscow rather than some peasant village. Those careers would rather look to their own interests than fight for a cause greater than themselves. I urge Marshal Boroshilov every week that he needs to take a harder stance against our enemies, but he continues to give me the same tricks or tired excuses. We're not ready. We must look to our people first. It's driving me insane. Sometimes I feel like he'd rather take advice from Zukov uh, than me. Other than I. He's a good man, sure, but does he really have the stomach for what must be done in the name of reunification? Perhaps I've been about my problems for far too long. I apologize, my friend, but I've been rather frustrated as of late. Please don't be afraid to tell me of your own exploits, as I'm sure other troubles have much in common. Regards, Mikhail Nikolaevich Tuchakevsky. Hey, they pay the tribute. Thank you. If you'd like to read about this, go right ahead. This happens every time, usually every time, we uh, play, so. Very good, my friends. The failures of Barbarossa. And equipment will be first, as well as... I want to just. I want. Mm, we could really use more soldiers. We could really, really, really use more soldiers. And actually, we're one, two, three, four. We have four things being built, so that's not too bad. And I'd rather get tanks going than APCs first. So, uh, let's see. Let's go with three, and then three, and then three. So that's going to take some time. Manpower is not going to be that much. I'm going to go for manpower first. I almost always choose the other one, but let's go for manpower. A toast. The captain was quiet. And he was usually quite modest and occasionally stern. A fine red army officer who carried out his duties without comment or question. Except on nights like tonight where the captain got his cops with his men and told him stories. Stories full of joy and sorrow and humor. A few doses of vodka in his belly, the captain was that magnificent and sometimes ineloquent storyteller. However, tonight he only had a few drinks and his words rang out as clear as day. The young man, he said, standing up in his chair so they could all see him, the bottle in hand. You don't remember what things were like before. Most of you were babies, some not even born. But I was there. I was only just out of school, no older than some of you, when I was sent to the front lines of the Great Patriotic War. I was there at Kiev, Kursk. Boril Shilovgrad, and then in Moscow, defeat after defeat after defeat. You young men do not know how bitter it tastes. He grew quiet then as in the room. He looked around at the faces of his subordinates, a hint of sadness across his face, and then took a long swig of vodka. The Germans, they had tanks, planes, so-propelled so artillery, rocket launchers, and all kinds of other crap. And what do we have? Half of our men didn't even have a rifle, yet we still put up a good fight. Many young men, just fine, fine young men, just like you, died in those days and died fighting for every inch of Russian soil we lost to those Nazi dogs. And it's because of them that we are here, still here today, still alive, still fighting. He lifted up his bottle and made a toast. To the brave boys of the Red Army, he roared, putting the bottle to his lips and guzzling down the vodka. The soldiers turned back, happy to be warm and drunk and Russian. To the brave boys of the Red Army. Cool. Wow, how do we get minus... Holy crap. No unemployment subsidies. Musician and the Marshal, Mikhail. It's good to hear from you. I admit I've not been paying much attention to whatever's happening beyond the Urals. I'm glad you were able to shed some light on this. I am, as you probably guessed, alive and well, regrettably. I've not had much opportunity to accomplish much in the way of musical pursuits as of late, as my obligations to the Central Siberian Republic have stolen my undivided attention. I realize I've, met, I've mentioned in the past that I have no love for politics, but strange circumstances such as these demand strange answers. If I can make a positive impact in this broken country, I will spare no effort. What you have told me concerns me deeply, however. I sense a great deal of pent-up rage within your words, and that your frustration seems to be getting the better of you. As your friend, I would sincerely advise caution. Venting is healthy, so I would not discourage you on that front, however. Please ensure that you do not lose yourself to your frustrations. A man in your position would do well to keep a cool head, for that would be easy to commit evil deeds on the field of battle and a bout of wild rage. Take care, Dmitry Dmitry of Shostakovich. Oh! Oh, okay. He actually replied to uh, Shostakovich. That's actually really cool. But man, oh man, we could use more manpower and stability. Holy crap, we need a lot of stability. The failures of Suvorov. Ah, big sadness. Big sadness when things don't go as well we, as we really want them to go. Veterans. Oh, yeah. The National Spirits. Of course, we have the loop off the terror bombings. Boros Shilov is our leader. Veterans of the Long War. Oh, yeah, we got a lot. That's not too bad. I like that. Agricultural insecurity. Ooh, that is not good. But sounds really uh, communist. Pertinent manners. Although all men, women, and children understand the suffering we've gone through and the necessity for all Russian peoples to unite to once again claim the glory of the Soviet. Of, Union of Soviet Social Republics. The Nazis are not the only obstacle in the way. Marshal Voyal Shilov has excellently led a band of military officers to establish a rule over the front and maintain safety and security for our people. However, the man ages further and further with every year, and our front has continued to break down into separate factions with differing ideas on how to lead the Marshal Victory. Georgi Zukov continues to lead a libera liberalizing faction designing devotion to the communist cause. 
In reforming spikes of governmental inefficiency through promises of reform, meanwhile, the Red Bonaparte, Mikhail T Tukhachevsky, ardently rallies for the militarization of the front, calling to abandon Bukharin's failing ideas and use the Red Army's support for social exchange. Nevertheless, the front continues to march on, unsure of the future in these dangerous times. Journal page. Boris and Pavel hardly spared me a glance when I hobbled onto my office like a hunchback, um, bottle nut my undercoat. Oh, is there ever plenty enough time to drink nowadays? My signature counts for nothing when the front's generals do whatever they please, with or without it. So much for, what is that again? Oh, Clem marshalling the Red Army to the Kremlin? Ha, ha, Marty, 80. The most I can marshal at this point are dining napkins and shot glasses. So can you blame me for wasting my liver away while at work? Thought not. The old dude has plenty of things to forget anyways. My wasting body, the Red Army, the horse and Tchaikovsky, Finland, Suvarov. Suvarov. Ah, Suvarov. I've had another dream about it last night. It ended the same as it ended the night before. Waves of good men slaughtered like wheat against the scythe. Fields of burning tanks, holes, hulks, spewing smoke and burning, screaming bodies. The whole generation of Russians lost in a bad man's gambit. Sometimes they call it to me when I close my eyes, something I can hear. Sometimes I can hear nothing, so, which is better, I don't know. I stared at the mirror this morning while washing my face. My eyes saw Clement Voroshilov, Clement the Grand Marshal, the hero of Tsartsin, Clement the twice failure of Finland and Suvarov, and a hundred more battles in Tsartsin. Oh, it's Tsartsin. My hands are stained with more blood than all my generals combined. And not even alcohol could wash it away. More political power and or support. Not bad. Actually, that's really good for us. I don't know. Can we actually play as Zukov or Tukhachevsky? Maybe. I guess we have to choose. Oh, I guess we have to choose. The Red Bonaparte. The agricultural situation ultimatum from Vorkuta. Okay, so you like to read that about that guard ahead. But now we gotta defend. Oh no, not for yeah, against oh wait, we're already up. For some reason I thought it was Vyatka at first. Um really Vyatka? Or not Vyatka. Vorkuto. Really Vyatka? Really guys? V word? I mean we literally just won a battle against you, son. I'm mean, they're making it too easy here. They're making it too easy. I love Vorkuta. Use those labor camps. And just keep making things. Beneath their, their no, notice them. Raskalov Bogdan Anatolievich was doing his regular duties as a janitor of floor 7 of the WRRF Central Committee headquarters in the Arkhangelsk Oblast when he began to hear a loud murmuring originating from one of the doors. Floor 7 officially 4 for mid-level bureaucrats was unofficially the dumping ground of every mess-up in the WRRF too well connected to be thrown out by not useful enough. But not useful enough to justify moving up to the committee. That was alright for Raskalov, who enjoyed the bitter conversations he could hear, which were always entertaining to hear. But this is not one of those conversations. This one was a solemn discussion between men who seemed to have something a bit above bitterness to chew on for um, to chew on for once. How long do we have? The projections are right, six months max, and they won't be. Anne was going to run out first, so it'll make it easy pickings for bandits. Good God! The voices seemed to stop them. Fall by what sounded like sobbing. Under normal circumstances, Raskalov would have felt like panicking. He should have felt like panicking. He should have felt a pit in his stomach, the horror rising in his body as he thought of his impending starvation and death. But he didn't. For he knew someone who was not well known in polite society. A guy who knew a guy who knew a guy who would be more than willing to reward him for his information. Who would be willing to take him in while they lynch these little dudes. Raskoloff smiled and returned to cleaning the floor. Being a grunt has its perks. Thank you for the army XP and the enemies defeated. If you'd like to read about this, go right ahead. Stability, which is great. Political power and more rifles, which we could actually really, really use. I love it. Assassination, assassination attempt? Now, Field Marshal, you can't be personally leading these guys. Come on, man. You know better. Ah, uh, it doesn't really matter. Burton, it matters. Uh, since we're fighting, though, North, we'll also do that one, too. Cool. All right. Um. Okay, so the agriculture situation. The soldiers of the West, West... Russian Revolutionary Front are set fast. Her workers are industrious and her leaders bold and decadent, however, are dedicated. These mean nothing if there's no food in their stomachs. Although large amounts of food supplies were brought from more southerly regions in the formation of the Front, they're being to run out, beginning to run out. Most of the land that we control is barren and unsuitable for agriculture, and although we have begun attempts to trade with other warlord states, the bombing campaigns, the loot pop ups frustrated any meaningful attempts to import food from elsewhere. If something isn't done, the entire country will starve. A council must be called to assess the agricultural situation in the Front, and new, drastic plans must be drawn for the sake of our survival. Whatever the cost, or whatever arable lands we hold must be devoted to agriculture, new trade deals must be made, and rations must be stretched tight if we are to eat every, even a single meal in the coming days. A moment's reprieve. A kingdom without an heir invites chaos through an interregnum. A kingdom with more than one. Chaos through civil war. So what does the West Revolutionary Front seem to shamble towards the latter without the pause? Its aging picture, Clement Voroshilov, 
weakens in strength and vigor with every moment he holds the title and duties of the Grand Marshal. Many fear the day of the hero of West Russia is combined to a bed rest until his passing, not simply out of concern for the man's health, but also for the bedlam that may ensue after his funeral. For as it stands, there are two contenders laying claim to the Grand Marshal Voroshilov's legacy, Mikhail Tuchevsky and Georgi Zukov. For all that they are each other's polar opposites in many respects, philosophies, temperaments, methods, the French two greatest generals are also each other's equals, at least all in skill. A statement must be, or statement must be, such as this will only be resolved by beings greater than mortal men. Thus have the fates and other omniscience, om, omniscience chosen the Red, oh, Red Napoleon, people's marshal. I don't know, man. I didn't want it to choose early on. Best friends increase his influence. A harsh truth. Escalate industry eastwards. All right, learn from America. Into the future, why we fight, why we survive, United Front. Zukov, or this guy? I'll pull the system. Ooh, army professionalism and agriculture gets worse. Ooh, that's not good. Shift the blame. It seems like what other people might want to choose is Zukov, because he's so well known. <clears throat> but screw it. You know what? Let's go with the Red Napoleon. That seems like a wild thing to do. The Red Bonaparte. As Tuchevsky uh, joined the two figures on the hill, he announced his presence with a gruff Uborovich Ustinov. Ustinov snapped to attention while Uborovich simply nodded. Major General Ustinov and I were inspecting the troops as it were. These men are undisciplined, Mikhail scowled as he watched the so called platoon. Marching in lockstep, interpretive dance aside, stumbling was a better term. Tukhachevsky marched smartly down the hill, barking, Attention! The men dragged their feet as they rose. The drill instructor did something they, like a salute, but did not. But not. Uh, Comrade Tukhachevsky, the man smiled, withered at the marshal's gaze. Your name? Uh, Antonin, sir. Sergeant Ardenin Orlov. Private Orlov, fall in line. The man opened mouth. Sir, to speak. Now, private. Tukhachevsky took his head as Orlov fell in. The Red Army, the pride of the Union, the sword of the Revolution, reduced to this. Pathetic. The marshal's glare alone was enough to freeze the men where they stood. You will adjust me as marshal. You'll follow every order I give without question. I will put you through hell and back, and you will learn to thank me for it. Am I understood? Yes, sir, the men shouted meekly. It's a start. Tukhachevsky pointed at the field. Now run, all of you. Twenty times around the field. Now, a shock silence. Then they burst into sprints, like dominoes falling. He gave them a ten-second lead. By the end of the task, he was in the front of the pack. Bring discipline to the ranks. Nice. Oh, that's a lot of political power. Wow. And that's what you have to do. Oh, holy crap. What is this? Succession of Laurel Shilov? Yeah, if you want to lead, you do it from the front. That's what I normally do. Anyways, uh, most uh, powerful ability in the shade of Russia. Laurel mm. Shilov has become senile. Uh, the two are in a bitter power struggle. Two contenders exist for the title of Grand Marshal. So the balance power is in favor of Tukhachevsky. Tukhachevsky. I'm saying that right, yeah. Cool. Appease Zukov, decrease factionalism, increase his influence, increase faction, decrease influence, we lose stability, meet with the veterans, decrease factionalism, hold military parade. Can we end up in a civil war? Seems like we can't. Ooh, I like that one. I like that one a lot. But we don't have enough manpower or guns. Publish military theory. Um, that seems kind of cool. I kind of like that. I want to see what happens with that one. Meet with Voroshilov. Snow Maiden sounds awesome. Firebird? Disastrous consequences? He's making moves, of course. Well, work against him? Might as well, right? Except for, except from Tukhachevsky's new memoir. Taken from chapter 3, page 204, The Structure of the Militia Army and the Operation Silverov by Mikhail Tukhachevsky. The fault of our Operation Sphere can be put solely on the shoulders of two men, Mikhail Suslov and Georgi Zukov. While the front was struggling its hardest and made great gains, Suslov has been plotting his demise since its beginning, anticipating for the perfect moment of his betrayal. And while the true men of the Red Army put on everything they had in the greatest battle for Russia, Zukov showed the greatest immaturity and made numerous attempted strategic blunders. Actually, I'm going to go and grab this too. The Russian Suslov could perhaps be considered Russia's greatest traitor. During the greatest test of Russian courage, as the front had to evacuate in the face of the renewed Hunnic offensive. Suslov chose not to fight for the motherland, but he chose to betray us. Biding his time till we were vulnerable, he and his co conspirators attempted to coup our rightful government. Luckily, his attempts were thwarted, but the scheme was still cost us any chance of keeping the front together and allowed it to dissolve into reactionary warlords. Zukov's attitude towards the war was one of immaturity with a healthy amount of misconduct. His inability to put aside political differences and disappointing attitudes in battle made him the laughingstock of officers and soldiers alike. What actually cost us the battle, however, was Zukov's indifference towards strategy. His strategic incompetence meant that the men were applied incorrectly, costing lives in entire battles. If Zukov, if only he had paid attention in officer school, perhaps I would be writing victories in Moscow rather than ones that defeat in our uncles. We were this close. No bonus for land auction. Nice. I love doing infrastructure, but this seems a little bit more important to do. Meet with world. Well, we're not going to do this one, no. Meet with veterans. 
Yes. Yes, more meeting with veterans. Operation Firebird. Uh, I think we're okay with that. Boral Shilov? Maybe. When's it? Research is going to be done. It's going to be done in a while. Alright, I think we can just kind of hang out and wait first then. Oh, wait. And scams for loot. Don't forget about that. Anyone want to have loot? No Negra, Vokuta, nope. It's alright. Ration calculations? Uh, sure. Why not? I like this one. Because I'm going to get more political power first, so. And they'll do go down the, the red bone part. After the end of the West Russian War and the subsequent rebellions of the reactionaries and traitors in the South, the front now maintains power only above or over the White Sea coast and environs. Now, while we have endured the, these difficult years, life in the North is not without its drawbacks. The land here, though vast and seeming almost limitless, is cold and the soil is not arable. Through rationing, this food so far has lasted, but for how long, no one knows. To alleviate the pressure of our food stocks, we must change the ration system, reforming it to be more egalitarian and scientific. Our officers will be calculating the rations based on calories, giving every loyal soldier at the front at their minimum to survive for the day. Though this is a hard and undeserved burden, the socialism expects all of us to share our joys and hardships. Uh, what was that other one? Zukov's making moves. Agricultural situation. Right here. Cool. Anything else new, different? Just gotta keep an eye on who, on if anyone has any treasure. So, I think we don't... We're doing really well so far. So, Yulia carries the food rations home. Even the diminished supply of food, it was difficult for her to bring everything back home by herself. Her husband toiled in the factory at this time of day and he could not help bring her home the family supplies for the week. Once, once home, the food was unpacked and set in front of her on the table. A careful balancing act had to follow. Her husband received a fair share of the week's calorie supply. Reducing his allotment may further lead to him collapsing again in the workshop. Factory work is energy intensive. Stale flour from Comey made up a lot, a lot of the week's food. She reserved some of the canned vegetables for Ilosia. The boy had recently gotten over a nasty flu and needed extra vitamins. On, on and on, her calculations and allocations went. Eventually, she had a good idea how to stretch out the food for a week. Yulia could not help but notice that the week's total was smaller than the previous week. A border conflict in the south had disrupted the transportation network. This must have delayed food imports considerably. Added to the issue was a year's meager harvest. Farming this close to the Arctic Circle was not a simple proposition. As a result, the front's government had to dip in its food reserve every year. The increasingly low level of the stockpiles was an open secret. The region faced starvation within the next few years if nothing was done. There was not Yulia could do about it. In the summer month, she would have access to her small garden plot anew. There was at least there at least would come a few extra nutrients for the family's needs. Not too much food to go around. Yeah, that sucks. I could not spend more on infrastructure, but I kind of want to wait and hold it for now and see what happens. Oh, it's a... Oh. Oh. Baratia. Hello there. Libertarian socialism, huh? Hmm. We'll see about them. And then we get to do, maybe hopefully, vacuum computing... Vacuum tube computing soon enough, too. Croatia Modem. What will the future bring? We don't really care right now about them. We have bigger things to do. We have only a single loot. Oh, actually. Onega? Um, I'm going to say no, because fighting over that river is going to be pretty difficult, so an ultimatum. Never mind. Actually, do these guys have a focus tree? No, it doesn't look like they do. So now we have two loot, and we're going to go with agricultural methods, because that actually makes a lot of sense for us right now. Uh, how many more days do we have for this? Nine days, that's fine. Appease work against them. Increase factionalism. That's alright. Alright. Oh, we can prepare that too. You know what? If we beat them, and then we try to fight them... Oh, they're not looking that good, actually. I'm getting our guys over here, getting them some more organization before we actually start fighting. All good stuff. Must have been a new month. Got a little bit more manpower, perhaps. Our soldiers are over here. We will not back down so easily. Ration calculations. I would like even more, but let's see. I would like that army professions. So, investments in Plesek. The Great Marshal Tukhachevsky leads his fiefdom of Plesek, defending the front's borders from raiders and reactionaries alike. Tukhachevsky is one of the truest and most loyal followers of the front's ideals. It is time he deserves payback for all the victories he has brought us. Investitures must be made in Plesek. To reward him, and soon even Arkhangos will see a return. New roads, railways, and urban development will be set in place for the growth of a small town into a large factory city to fit fit to produce the finest weapons of Russia. Calculating ration size. Arkhangos has never been meant to be the capitals of the WRRF. And the chaos that followed the front's collapse in the 50s, a long march north had seen the Red Armies drag everything it could away from the German army and the Russian Confederates. The fallback position has been Siktivkyar, well stocked power and weapons and equipment. But when the cursed Luftwaffe began bombing important buildings just as the Red Army and the refugee columns entered the city, 
and the ensuing pounds, the leadership had decided to move further north from the compromised city by the time the dust had settled. Sictive Guard slipped from France control and entered the hand of the young Komi Republic. It had been decades since then, and the mess of records had only been partially resolved. The Commissar, doing the day's research, knew research work knew that the government had an idea of this food stockpile level. Not very high, and how long they would last, not very. But the proper numbers were critical. Running out of food a month early would have catastrophic catastrophic consequences. Letting crates of food go bad without using them would be equally intolerable, and so the WRRF's daily calculations were carried on every day. Projected food reserves were stretched over projected calorie needs for factory workers, pregnant women, soldiers, children, everyone else. Every new crate of food made a real difference in the life of the front citizens. Someday we won't need all this stale food. Go ahead and start raiding them. The enemy's defeated. Great! Great, great. Would you like an upgrade, sir? Yes, yes, you would. Anything else around here? So it's 31. Oh, 20. Oh, he really raised it even quite a bit higher. We can maybe try Operation Firebird to be paid. Hey! They wanted. We beat them up. They paid us. Or we beat them back, and then. That is just beautiful, my friends. Come back over here, because we can probably go to the war with these guys again eventually. Or, you know, border raid and such. I'm meeting with Boral Shilov. He stepped into the room, uh, ready to speak to the old man. He had been summoned to the front headquarters for a regular debriefing and like dinner with, with the in laws. He knew conversation with the ardent ancient general would always end in large bouts of screaming, fighting, and leaving both angered and disgusted. This time, Tukhachevsky hoped that at least he would be able to keep things from getting out of hand long enough to convince Voroshilov Shilov that perhaps he wasn't such a bad man for a successor. You took your time, you're eight minutes late, Voroshilov Shilov said dryly. They were not off to a great start and knew that Voroshilov Shilov would not make it easily to be friendly. My apologies, Marshal Tukhachevsky said, biting his lip. What did you call me here to discuss? This nice act was getting very hard to keep up. I'd like your input on strategic decisions for the own Neckin campaign you suggested. Tukhachevsky felt set, felt set up. Tactics and strategy always meant fights when it came to him and Voroshilov. I think we should hit them with artillery for a short time before doing any mass uh, several mass attacks on the border posts. Tukhachevsky knew that he was testing him, but cannot hold himself back. Are you sure? That would give them time to prepare. I see position our men in hidden positions nearby, doing a short mortar strike before ordering mass offenses. This had been a test, but Tukhachevsky would not back down. The argument continued to go back and forth, back and forth, with voices being raised and pitched in volume every second. Voroshilov accused Tukhachevsky of being out of order for his post, and Tukhachevsky said he wouldn't have have to be this way if Voroshilov wasn't such a bad strategist. Tukhachevsky stormed out seconds later. The meeting had gone exactly expected, and the only winner has been Zukov. We can't stay on bad terms with the old man forever, but this will increase the influence of Tukhachevsky. 31. Wow, 37. 30, oh, wow, 37, okay. Firebird. Extrajudicial measures. So is this worth doing? I don't know. I kind of don't want to do it because we might not do well, but then again, I guess it doesn't really matter too much. Uh, Class of the Triumvirate. Operation Firebird. I don't know what that does. I kind of want to do it. Let's do it. And if it goes poorly, then I'll just fade in, fade out, and do whatever, you know, we normally do. Directed to sabotage oil wells. Top secret communique from the office of Marshal of the Soviet Union, Mikhail Tukhachevsky. Sent to the office of Redacted at 1962.6.22.17. By order of, Mich order of Marshal of the Soviet Union, Mikhail Tukhachevsky, soldiers of Redacted are to immediately carry out the following assignment. <clears throat> With utmost regard to mission security, secrecy, and confidentiality, it cannot be understated that the knowledge of the following information is only be given out on a need to know basis to those who may concern. Violation is punishable by death. Men under your commander to assume fake identities allow passage through into Yukta oil wells, which Marshal of the Soviet Union Zukov controls and operates. From there, these men are ordered to use any means necessary to disrupt and sabotage the functionality of these oil wells in order to prevent those oil wells from fulfilling the established quota. Those will have the dual effect of decreasing the trust of the public in Zukov as well as embarrassing him nationally. From there, those involved are returned undetected to their posts in Plesak, where they are to be kept under surveillance by agents for several weeks to ensure they do not speak to any about this operation. If you learn of them speaking freely about these happenings, they will be similarly executed and the events dismissed as the ramblings of traitors. Glory to the Soviet Union and the West Russian Revolutionary Front. Using our Red Army papers, use ROA papers from the West Russian Revolutionary War to access the XOL. Sneak into the Yukuta. Um, Red Army papers, huh? Use ROA papers. I don't know. Whichever one we choose, it seems like we could end this in disaster. Red Army from the West Russian Revolutionary War. That seems so dated, though. Our men sneak into there. Well, that seems more... Yeah, let's, let's, do, oh, let's do that one, just because if we sneak into there, that seems a little bit more promising. It's going to be with veterans. <clears throat> seems like we need a lot of political power for this this uh, warlord. Want to go into the war? No one cares. 
Thank you. The Marcus men sneak into Yucatan. Under the veiled moonlight, two faces under the facade of black charcoal paint stare into the barbed wire fence of the black jewel of Yucatan. Yucatan. Its oil processing complex, the pride of Zuka, these two men working directly for Tukachevsky, bore the papers of Lasov's traders as they looked down at the base with binoculars. The tree line they mapped out their events. Having started for the journey from miles away in a nearby village posing as inspectors, they backed back to the location of Zuka's oil wells using information from the inside to avoid any prying eyes of the guard outposts, checkpoints, or even hunters. Apparently, the terror of the traders are away. Any who saw them would have put their mission at risk, and it was important that they maintain, com maintain complete uh, unseenage or com remain completely unseen until they could be misidentified as foreign agents. Taking the bottle bolt cutters from his bag, the two men waited until a patrol had passed to make the play. Running down into the exterior of the base, they swiftly cut open a small hole at the base of the fence and circled their way through. As soon as they had both reached the other side, they ran for cover. They were in the heart of Zukov's oil plant, all according to ban plan. Boom. We're going to continue securing control. We need more stability. Boom! We've gotten word from our clandestine resources that their operation was a success. Our agents have successfully sabotaged the Yucatan oil wells, leading to more than half of their wells being heavily damaged. With many in such deep disrepair that they may need to be completely replaced, the process would take months. Using explosives, the men deceived authorities and planted them on several oil wells. The explosion caused a panic among the well, uh, leading on to, to on-site fire services to put it out. In the chaos, the two men were able to successfully flee, flee the scene. Well, Zukov may not have been aware of it yet, a great victory has been won against him. We have evidence that he had not been notified, but our men are already on the run in Yukta and are willing to evade capture. When they return to us, they will be welcomed warmly for the role in combating Zukov's influence. Most importantly, Zukov's inability to meet quota and the embarrassment of revealing his wells or sabotage is an important victory. First we crush Zukov, then we crush our true enemies beyond the borders. Another great success. As he's doing... Oh, there goes Burgundy. Uh, right. A furious marshal. Zukov anxiously taps his foot on the ground, impatiently waiting for the head of his oil wells to come out and greet him. Having been summoned without haste without an explanation, it was more than a bit annoyed and even more curious as to what could be important enough to bring him out here in the middle of the night, weeks before an inspection tour was supposed to take place. His mind had gone through all the possibilities he could imagine, from workers complaining to an accident, or perhaps even held out hope that perhaps it would be good news. After some, several minutes of waiting, the manager appeared from the door, looking exhausted as he said, I think you'll want to see this. Already sick of waiting, Zukov decided to humor the man, and his, but his anxiety and anger was only rising every second, now reaching fever pitched levels. Walking first through the cold, corridors, every step made the butterflies in his stomach flutter even more, and by the time he left the building, his heart had sunk. Looking out across the wells, Zukov felt the anxiety turn to rage as his face contorted to a scowl, and his scowl to a shout. Out of the many dozens of wells, many were noticeably damaged, and of those, some were completely destroyed. Knowing the importance of the quotas placed on his oil production and how tied to his reputation they were, he let all of his all, he let it all out on the poor station manager before letting the entire maintenance and guard team have it as well. With spit flying from his mouth, all who were stood there, who who were all there stood silently as he roared. I apologize for my mispronunciation of words. Zukov knew he had been blessed, and he swore to God it was Zukachevsky doing, but could not prove it. But if he could, it would be Zukachevsky's undoing as well. I pity those workers. Smirch on the case of sabotage oil wells. This is probably a bad idea to do, but whatever. Smirch. Okay, so after learning the extensive damage done to his oil wells, our adversary Zukov was report reportedly furious. The destruction of his represents no chance of him to meet his quota, which will lead to some incredibly awkward conversations between him and Voroshilov as to how he let most of his important assets be sabotaged. In his fury, he ordered for Smirch to investigate, and with our agents not yet safe and sound and whereabouts are not entirely known, we cannot do anything but hope they are able to return to Plus before Smirch catches up to them. For us to be implicated in the sabotage of the oil wells would completely embarrass us and any chance of our victory in the power struggle or perhaps disappear for good. However, if Zukov fails to find a separate tour, this will further tarnish his reputation. We can only imagine how good the tailing off of he got from Voroshilov, Voroshilov was, perhaps enough to tip his opinion on the favor. But that's enough. We have, done enough. we have documents of burning people to question. Our participation in the sabotage of Zukov's oil wells cannot get out. Power struggle? An icy grave? Uh, our plot revealed? Well, that doesn't sound good. Let's go with an icy grave, then. Oh, investments. <clears throat> Provide additional officers. The A. A. Tukhachevsky has lent us as proving useful. The application of war communism within the front itself has manifested itself in the number of rifles currently in use by the front's army. Soon, no soldier in the front shall find himself without a reliable weapon. In solving this problem, we stumble into another. Another. Despite the abundance of guns, our soldiers do not have the proper training of, or officership to make use of it. To resolve this issue, we will need to rely on Comrade Tukhachevsky again. We will send him our officers to, for him to train in the ways of war communism, while his officers will come into the hails or halls of Arkhangos to instruct the soldiers up to his standard. With the help of Markle, Marshal Tukhachevsky, the front will begin to march forward, and socialism will soon spread itself into the rest of the world in nasty grave. Over here, over here, Nikolai screamed to his associate. Having been put on the case days ago, he and his worker partner Denigan had been assigned to the combating 
combing an entire forest some miles west of, the, west of the wells. The truth was, it was snow, snow, and more snow. The temper was bit, bitingly cold, and that was not helped by the fact that they had to scale the mountainside every day, walk past the same gosh darn trees every day to see the same gosh darn animals, and get home with the same gosh darn numb toes. However, Nikolai just found something. Looking down in a small ravine to catch his breath after a relatively tough climbing episode, he'd seen an object covered in snow and surrounded by ice. Then again, was beside him in seconds. Pan panting to ask what he found, Nikolai descended the cliff on the ravine, slipping on a rock where it had actually been snow and falling place first on, back first on the ground. Though badly hurt, he couldn't wait and forced himself to his knees, crawling to the strange object. He wiped off the snow, and sure enough, it was a man, Dinnigan, having found a long way around bringing him down, arrived some minutes later as Nikolai closely examined the bodies he found. Two, each wearing the insignia of the Vlasov's ROA, were dead at the bottom of the mountain, ravine, where they figured they had likely tried to go into for warmth before dying of exposure during the night. Each agent took a man's corpse over their shoulders and painfully slowly got it back into the car. The men working in the Smear headquarters did full background checks on them. C working currently as low-ranking Tukhachevsky associates, both were found to have ROA connections, and one was a rehabilitated member of the group. The case was closed. It was an ROA job. What a grim way to go. At least we're not implicated. Whee! That's great. I love it. At least we're not implicated. And that's going to be 45 to 29.25. Man, he's getting a lot more support than we are. Oh, God. Hey, are we meeting with him again? Oh, look how vacuum tube's done. Finally, finally, finally. Time for some transistor computing. When can we raid? Eh, I probably don't need to see this one. Mm, not bad, not bad, not bad. Work against them? Decrease factionalism? So be it. Oh, wait. Wait, wasn't it a 49? We just went down to 40. No. Oh. Okay, that's weird. Provide additional officers. I'll pull the system. Well, I would like to get examine the stockpiles. When the front retreated into Angles and following, following the end of the rest of Russian war, it hurriedly secured its most vital equipment into a number of vast warehouses. Having no use for these tools, officers did not open them, as their maintenance would only impose an undue burden on overstock or overstretched front. However, high command now wonders whether or not these stockpiles may have held canned food or other useful rations in addition to equipment. We will send our soldiers, accompanied by commissars, into these warehouses, tasking them with finding supplies for the front. If they find these, they would then transport these into our storehouses, which then we can distribute it to men equally. Though not magical tablecloths that can summon feasts from nowhere, any scraps that we can find will help the front, even after it is dead and long gone. The old, still, the old union still finds a way to feed its children. Nice. And on the clock, bean counting, necessary sacrifices. Ooh, a courtesy call. Telegram from Arkhangelsk was delivered to General Tukhachevsky. Marshal Voroshilov's curt tone shown through the orders. The firm requested Tukhachevsky to send some of his experienced soldiers officers up north. In exchange, a fresh batch of recruits with college-level education would be sent south to the military frontier for training. Sitting at his desk, <clears throat> Tukhachevsky looked at the pile of paperwork prepared by his aides. The general found it slightly heartbreaking to write the relocation orders. Losing experienced staff was always disappointing. Even the prospect of seeing some of his loyalists in Arkhangelsk court politics did not change the fact that good officers were hard to come by. Repelling bandit raids and preparing offenses against the reactionaries to the south, but this is Tukhachevsky's assignment, and saying that Arkhangelsk's good graces was crucial for his future. And so the general filled relocation order after relocation order. By the time his job was done, his hand was cramped from signing so many orders. Upon being summoned, his assistant began transferring each other, or each order, in an envelope. All this mail would be forwarded to the various sectors of the front. And I'll be right back. All right, everyone, and we are back, ready to do another focus. Now, off screen, I go, went ahead and raided Vorkudu again, and we got the treasure event, so I got 75 more political power. That's why I have so much now. Put it on the clock. It's become clear from our studies and analysis of the front stockpiles that our food stocks are in a desperate, a fairly desperate situation. These shortages are not unsolvable, but dealing with them will require difficult sacrifices and unpopular choices. Still, this would not be the first time that such deprivation has turned its gaze in our direction. The front will endure, and the front will survive, and for the good of the front, we need to make these choices as soon as possible. At least we lose some more political power, but that's okay, especially since we raided these guys. And we got some more of this, more treasure. Uh, schools. Schools are not bad. I kind of like school stuff more than those other two. For the campaign, I'm going to meet with veterans once again. 47 versus 30.75. Very, very good. And Americans go to war with Guiana. Typical Americans trying to be violent with everyone. Yeah, at least we're building stuff too. That's not bad. Mm, appeasing him. Civilian construction. Don't mind if we do. That's a little bit ahead of time. Let's go ahead and grab some industry. We gotta do all the industry stuff first. On the clock, huh? Well, let's see. Oh, and again, it does have loot. And we they might come to raid us, maybe, but we'll see what happens. Uh, I like to do that one, but I'm gonna keep some political power for this stuff, too. So, actually, next research will be done in quite a while. So, after that, distribute some stuff. 
more army professionals than necessary sacrifices. The army of the F w r r f is the primary force that keeps us safe and afloat. As such, it must take priority when considering the allocation of food supplies. Our logistics officers will prioritize food shipments to the army, and anti-aircraft guns will be tasked with defending food stockpiles around our territories. Until we can achieve a reliable food supplies for all of our people, it is vital that our soldiers do not starve in the streets. That would be quite bad, I would say. Quite bad. Begin counting, and that makes it. Starshina Nikolai Petrov glanced up from the charts displayed on his desk. What again, comrade secretary? Nine, 3,925 tons of canned beef. Or beans, John Charles and next to Nikolai. On his left hand, with his pencil twice his fingers width, on his right hand, office paper scribbled with graphite lines. Smilingly, the quartermaster continued. Then suppose we consider how many tons we began in the month with, let's say, 30 days ago. The report mentions 4,370. How many tons is that, does the glorious Red Army eat every day? This time, pencil scratched, scratched, scratched paper a moment later. Moment longer than last. The child's brows furrowed as his lips hummed and pursed. Why do eyes and fix Nikolai with the question? Around 15? 14.83. Spend on work as always, Comrade Kirillov. A callous hand reached under the sec Comrade Secretary's officer hat. Two sizes too wide to the brim engulfed his forehead up to the brow line and toast. And toast. Uh, auburn blonde hair. There was much giggling and screeching. The Comrade Colonel will want today's reports. Don't want him to see. Well, don't want him to wait any longer, do we? At his father's mention, Comrade Kirillov hopped out of his seat and flashed Nikolai a tiny pencil line of salute. Right away, Comrade Sharshina, Starshina. Nikolai Petrov let both his own salute and smile drop as little Igor closed, shut his office door. Would if the Red Army were only losing beans. Hmm. My so pronunciations still aren't very good, apparently. An ultimatum from Onega, of course. Oh, you yeah. That's from the raid. No wonder we'd have no front lines yet. Cool. Go ahead and get over there. Get some planning done. Have a good time. Keep an eye on how long they're going to take. Nine days. We've got some time. I don't like not having manpower, I'll be honest. <laughs> uh, six days. Our guys are already over there. That's so good. Actually, the infantry and light infantry were there faster than the motorized. And they're looking not too strong over there, but give a little more days for a few more organization, organizational things. Ooh, 50, 52 guys is not bad. We actually do keep 52 guys? Nope. They went bye-bye. Alright, good luck. Are they just only attacking with one person? I'll take it. Work against them. Yes, please. Necessary sacrifices. Ooh, close economy, limited exports. I kind of like that. More output. The Fractured Republic. Ooh. Offer from the front, across the Urals, the Taos. The general straight. You know what? You guys should let me know. Should we do the Trader General? Should we do Across the Urals? Or should we do the Fractured Empire? Let me know in the comments below. Because now I want to go ahead and try... I don't like agricultural stuff getting worse. Ooh, Doctrine. Getting down here is going to take so long to get to stuff. Ready for victory. But I like the monthly change, though, so... We'll do distribution networks. Northern Russia, where the front currently resides, is a vast land. Due to its relative unimportance and lack of any dense population centers, it was not a priority to the old of administration to build infrastructure on it. Whatever railways and public-use roads that existed in this period were torn apart by the German bombers during the bombing campaign. And with the shipments of food coming in, many among the officer corps worry about its arriving or the food arriving spoiled and unusable. The food supply is secure. Now something else must be done. To ensure the speedy arrival of it, we will dispatch our soldiers and rebuild the roads and railways, as well as protecting the distribution network from bandits. In doing so, we will ensure that no man that fights under the banner of socialism shall go starving ever again, for socialists look after their own. Alright, very good. Kind of waiting to get more stability, but man, it's still going down all the time. Oh my goodness, no voting, huh? Research is looking not too bad. What do we have over here? There's a peace conference. Oh, man, yeah, those guys. American policing, huh? Building new schools will be done. Oh, uh, focus on our troops. Oh, okay, actually, buy infantry equipment. Uh, what is our equipment like right now? It's really not good. Um, it's only 10 political power. We must have tried, right? They're probably going to say no, but whatever. Doing quite well against these guys. Might as well, right? Equipment arrives. If you'd like to read about this, this one always happens if you actually get equipment from Zatal. So if you want to read it, go right ahead. Excellent. I'd love to train new workers, but whatever. 
Actually, they have more divisions than I thought they did, but maybe we won't be able to win. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. It'll be worth a shot, though. It'll be worth a shot. Meet with more veterans. Concerning of amount of factionalism, huh? Distribution networks, great. Pragmatic diplomacy, well, we'll do that one next time. Let's go uphold the system. During the early days of the Union of Soviet Social Republics, the great founders of a social state found itself in need of guaranteed emergency powers through the might of the Russian Red Army. Russia came under the power of the state of war communism, where all industries went under the process of immediate nationalization. All sources of food became managed by the military state in order to avoid a famine breaking in the state, and all men, women, and children undergoing strict discipline in their mandatory work to produce for the militarized Soviet state. Through this period of emergency, we found ourselves united and ready to face off against our rivals throughout the world. While we may have been broken eventually, the this is some lays living, ready to be used to, again to secure a place in the desolate wastelands of a broken Russia. Encouraging the strength of the Red Army to maintain control and governance over the front will allow us to secure control over everything we need and guarantee our, for our citizens a life of greatness through a life of dedicated socialism. Scavenge? And going to try to do attack, maybe? Maybe we can kill that division off, maybe? That'd be kind of nice, actually. Oh, they just paid the tribute. Great! I love it when they pay tributes. More equipment. I'd still like to work against them. Decrease factionalism? Decrease factionalism. Oh, that's what's hurting our stability. No, we don't do anything else. Increases influence? I don't want to get more influence. I guess factionalism is probably not good, so... We'll see what happens. How long does this... Is making moves? So do we have to rush down the left side of the tree for him to... For this to finish or something? The end of the Iron Storm. Okay, we'll probably have to finish through that. So... I don't care. Work against them. We got a lot of army XP. Wow. Voroshilov. Be an offensive dude. Nice. Very nice. Hey, 49 more guys join the front. Not bad. Up all the system. And then... Prozaryevska. Food. Food fills the stomach of our men, women, and children. Food is one of the greatest physical needs of the human body. Food is one of the foundations for social organization and civilization as men came together in times a long past to find new ways to produce greater amounts of food. And share amongst one another as civilization continues to grow further and stronger. We must guarantee the front's access to food for all, so we must we may find all the necessities we need to survive despite the desperate situation people have found themselves in. However, against the pillars of socialism, some individuals find themselves wracked with greed by hoarding a grain, our foundation for the basics of food, for their own profit. Thus we shall instate a state of Prozayevsorska. Or a confiscation of public access to supplies of grain in order to bolster states' food supplies. Doing so will allow the front's government to provide for its needy citizens, rather than allowing them to slave themselves over to privatize farmland to save off starvation. Everyone in the front must work together so that we may bring about a new age of prosperity for all, rather than suffering or suffer the dreadful fate of stagnation, starvation, and death. From opposer and Archangels, let all the true proletarians know the Red Army's duties. The Red Army centralizes all war criminal or war critical industries under its guidance, directly manages all railways under its control, regulates all commerce from outside Russia, commissions non-working classes into workers' roles when necessary, forbids all workers' gatherings until the war's end, distributes evenly our temporarily meager stockpiles of food, requisitions grains and livestock from farmers when necessary, and prohibits all capitalist activities within its borders. Non-compliance is punishable by death. The revolution continues a sacred war. Every sacrifice to the motherland, an inch each to victory. Ignorance is no excuse for disobedience. I didn't want stability anyways, did I? Did I? I would love to train more troops. Oh, but hey, actually, I didn't show you guys this yet. So we are doing well on academic base. Let's see, research facilities are not going up. Agriculture is going up. Poverty is slowly going up, slightly, slightly, slightly. Power tools are doing better, as well as industrial expertise, as definitely as well as our army professionals, which I love, 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 love. After this one, the army of international proletariat. The corrupt fear of Germany has extended the monstrous tendrils of fascism throughout the world we struggle through, as their atrocities remain both innumerable and intolerable. Across Europe and beyond, across the seven seas and countless nations across the world, the fascists have crushed the lower classes of the world, forcing the proletariat across the world into a state of slavery, oppression, and virtual destruction as they stare down the master race who greatly affronts every single one of them. The Soviet Union held the promises of being able to provide for a wider protector of the communist cause, a vanguard of one would, one who could protect against such terrors incited by the fascist dictators across the world. We must recover our nature as a social shield of the world through ooh, the might of the Red Army and provide a spark of hope for all would-be socials desiring for freedom and equality against the oppression of the fascist jackboot. Just another day on the job. So how do you think I'll go around this time? Asked Borislav Dmitrev in the driver's seat. Beside him sat Vasily Pavlov, resting both his feet against the dashboard. Borislav's last rationed cigarette hung from his lips as he effused secondhand smoke through the cabin. That's the fifth time we've done this song and dance this week, Boris. Kulaks always fall when they're at the front end of a barrel. 
Boros Lofts peered ahead when the Sarge, or Sarge and the rest, confronted an old man on his homestead's front porch. He squinted and leaned closer to the windshield. The old man seemed to edge a hand into one of the tattered robe's tears, ter tears, right on top of what seemed like a bump, almost as if the driver nudged his old friend, Vasilii. And it's not like they have something to threaten us with, now do they? Command had us unpound every gun west of the Urals for a long time ago. If some cool thinks they can come, out, come, out, uh, come at us, while well, the rest would sickle. Vasily, so what could possibly go wrong? A bang, a distant thud, shooting. Vasily, you horse on cannons bleeding cut, or bleeding out. The dude played with both his gun, his grain, and his life. Oh man, that sucks. We, we lost manpower we didn't even have. I'm gonna transistor computing. Ooh, security control, don't mind if we do. We're gonna work against him too. Oh, research. Oh, nice, we got that one done. So, it's 63. I'm going to go ahead and begin doing land auction. Oh, man, actually, maybe not. Speed? We don't have that many. We don't have, even have a tank. Now, I was told that maybe we could use helicopters in this campaign. I don't know. So, just in case, I'm going to go with infantry rifles anyways. Can we use helicopters? I mean, technically, yeah, we can. We can research them like I, what I did when I played as Magadan to... Um, Wurbles. Mercenary American first. Mercenary group. United States of Siberia group, so I don't know. Can we use them? If not, we'll just use tanks. You know, that seems more like a, like a Zukov thing to do. Maybe we should use helicopters then. Maybe, maybe not. Just because if when I play as WRRF again as Zukov, then I'll definitely use a lot of tanks. So, hmm. Decisions, decisions, decisions. We still have one loot though. An ultimatum from Onega. Go ahead, try it, you pieces of garbage. Enemies defeated. Awesome. 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 Alright, I guess it's Archer now. Great, my friends. Great. Deep Battle Theory. After the dark days of the Civil War, the Red Army found itself victorious upon the battlefield across the lands of fought so bravely crossed from the Taiga to the Baltic Sea. It was then that a certain late, late Vladimir Thrandelfilov and Averil Mikhail Tukhachevsky crafted the development of a new doctrine to organize the broken apart Soviet forces and find a new way to bring about victory past the strength of our enemies, a deep battle theory. The complete and thorough organization of thought behind every level of combat, from the individual tactics of the small army regiment to the complete operations spanning across continents, with several plans assigned to every front of the war in order to guarantee complete and overwhelming success. While we suffer greatly in the wake of the Second World War through our defeat, we mustn't abandon our truly successful theories and machinations of war. Thus, we shall continue to organize our forces in order to guarantee the greatest level of success possible in these trying times through a tried and true methods. Very good. So if we can, if we do choose to do helicopters, then I will probably do the far left land doctrine. I forget which one it is exactly called. Hey, the failure should be great. Thank you. We need more manpower. Uh, we'll probably do combined operations if we choose to do helicopters. Should we do helicopters? Let me know in the comments below. Because I love helicopters. I love, 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 love them. Alright, agricultural methods. Even though it went lower because of our last focus, it's not going to be bad. Still one a month. Not bad. Agriculture and security. Oh, it's looking a little better. Uh, let's see. Military parade would be nice. 41. We have 63.63 to 41.25. That's not bad. I would like to do this. I would like to train our troops some more as well, but... Oh, scan for loot. Don't mind if we do. Do they have loot? They do not have loot, so... And let's finish this episode with pragmatic diplomacy. A wise German once said, First comes a full stomach, then comes ethics. The land that we currently control does not produce enough food to feed all of our people, let alone feel the struggle against the Nazis. As such, it's imperative that we look for alternate services. While the many other warlords and statelets of the broken Russian state might not be supportive of our ideological outlook, we will certainly be willing to trade for food. Let, let us put aside amorphous ideas for the moment, and make sure that our people have enough food to live on. The Lord of Shilov's order. In the end, it was Tukhachevsky's proposal that held the most merit. The general was often criticized for his breathtaking ego, yet Tukhachevsky's ideas about Reforms showed a level of introspection that impressed the old marshal. Voro Shilov's first move would likely be a reform of the command structure. It would not be popular to wrangle troops away from the ambitious generals, but a better integration of various armies would be indispensable. Retraining officers and improving their understanding of deep battle will also be increasingly important at WRRF as we begin the unification wars with an army able to rapidly overrun its opponents. News from Plesek detailed Tukhachevsky being pleased and having started to teach some deep battle training to the newest recruits. And Yukta Zukov has been disappointed to see deep battle prioritization resume, but his factories have collaborated uh, with our early attempts to reorganize tank and vehicle production. Strategy perfected, and I hope you enjoyed today's first episode. If you did, consider leaving a like, subscribe if you're new, check, check out my Discord link in the description below if you haven't already, and I'll catch you tomorrow when we will make many choices and begin hopefully integrating or restoring the Soviet Union. Thanks for watching. Have a great communist rust-filled rest of your day.